Here we go. Great. Uh, welcome, everyone, to ESEA Office Hours. So the first item we want to talk about was spring monitoring. For those of you who are in the monitoring cycle for this year, that window has opened. It's open till this Friday, the 15th, is it Friday? No, Monday the 15th. Um, and there's medium items for those of you who are categorized as medium, high, and medium for those are, who are classified as high. So if you have any questions or are experiencing any difficulties in the tool or about these items, just reach out to your regional program manager and we'll be happy to help. We also just wanted to reiterate that the FY25 ESEA allocations are delayed. Um, they're starting to trickle in from the federal government and then we'll need to process them. So we're trying to get those to you as quickly as we can. Uh, and once we do have estimates, we will let you all know. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, as many of you are already aware, during our recent monitoring with the Federal Department of Education, it was determined that the way Maine allocates our Title II funds did not perfectly align with federal statute. So we want to, in spirit of open, honest communication, make sure everyone knows that there is a change in the Title IIA allocation process once we do get those figures from the federal government. Traditionally, what we have done in the past is accounted for students moving between districts from the district they reside in according to the census, which is the data we have to use for Title IIA allocations, and then moving those students and the, and the funding that goes with them to the district they actually attend. We will no longer be able to follow that process. We're strictly having to use census data um, on the number of students who are aged five to 17 living in that school area to determine Title IIA allocations. Those SAUs that were the most negatively affected by this change have already been notified with the lettering grants for me, and we try to use your FY24 allocations to give you an idea of what that change might look like. So if you did not receive that letter, or you're an ESCA coordinator or superintendent, because it went to both those people, and I believe the business manager as well, uh, you're not one of those folks who's highly uh, negatively affected by this. You might even be a district that's going to be positively affected by this. So I just want to make sure we're letting everybody know that you will see that change. For some of you, that change just is going to look like that normal noise from year to year you get in allocations. But for some folks, it will be pretty significant, uh, especially those who have a number of students who might attend in their district or out of their district through school choice. Daniel, you have your hand raised. Ryan, what about those districts who do not operate a school and tuition their students to a nearby district? Are those students no longer going to be accounted for? So if you operate a school, but maybe not a full K range of K to 12 schools, those districts will be receiving more in allocated funds. So uh, to use an example very close to home, I live in Bassaboro, where we operate a pre-K through eight school and students then have school choice for high school. So this school district, Vassarboro Schools, will receive that allocation for those 9 through 12 students that had previously been moved to the districts they actually lived in, which would be Augusta, Winslow, RSU 18 for students attending Erskine Academy. Those funds would stay in Vassarboro. So those districts that don't operate that full K-12 to range of schools will end up with a higher Title IIA allocation. Uh, and those that, again, benefited from school choice and students kind of moving into their district where they reside elsewhere will receive less in Title IIA allocations, unfortunately. And Ryan, does this also cover students who um, attend non-public schools in another district? So this is anyone who is accounted for on an October 1 count that we know moved from one geographic district to another. Thank you. And Ryan, was the letter sent to non-publics as well because of the Title II Equitable Services, or is that no, no, that's allocation? something that yeah, the LAO have to include that in their consultation process. And I know I've already received some contact from non-publics, so I know some folks have already taken that step to reach out and let them know. Great. Okay, and we'll keep going. 
All right, I know uh, folks have been hit with quite a few surveys lately, um, but just want to make sure everyone was on the same page. Every year, the U.S. Department of Education has an annual survey of SAUs about how they're using their Title II funds. In the past, it's been administered by WeStat. This year, it's being done by AIR. Uh, I believe they've done that initial reach out last week or the week before. So if you didn't get an email, you're likely going to be okay. Uh, they randomly choose districts in the state of Maine. It was about half of the SAUs that got chosen to take the survey. Just know we at the Maine DOE really don't have a whole lot to do with that survey other than providing them with your contact information and your FY24 allocation amounts. So any questions have to go to this uh, email title two at AAR, AIR.org. And for folks who transfer out of Title II? I believe there's a way to respond to that in the survey. Great, thank you. All right, lastly, uh, the Maine Department of Ed and Department of Labor have a recent initiative on alternative pathways for teacher certification for uh, developing new educator apprenticeship and pre-apprenticeship programs. These were funded through a variety of different grants, some of which are likely expiring, as we all know, a lot of that emergency relief funding is expiring here shortly. So we're asking for any feedback you may have on if this kind of work has been beneficial for your district, and if you want to see it continued or expanded. Um, and I'm kind of the, the point person for that context. If you have any feedback on those initiatives, feel free to reach out to me. And hopefully someone uh, on my team is putting a link to a, a press release we had if you've never heard of these initiatives to kind of help fill you in on what they're all about. Great. Let me do that. Title three. All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, so Title three has launched the pilot year of um, consortia for um, districts who may not have enough multilingual learners to generate the statutory required minimum of a hundred uh, sorry ten thousand dollar reward under title three and so what we're able to do is allow districts to band together in order to go through um, and receive that title three process um, the consortia will have to um, pick an LEA to be the fiscal agent, and then uh, subsequently will be responsible for um, administering uh, programs uh, required under statute, which would be the family engagement, professional development, and the improvement of instruction. So we just wanted to let folks know that this is now an option, and we are working diligently to um, get the rest of the guidance documents um, up and running for folks, and so we should have that soon. I'm on a ESCA office hour. Daniel, it's still you. Yep. Um, so I just wanted to reach out as well with some Title V updates. So we do want to let folks know that um, the RLIS Hold Harmless Districts will be receiving um, an updated amount this year. It, they were scheduled to receive 66% of their FY20 award. Um, now they're going to be receiving 83.3% of their award. Um, so the federal government has kind of given back a little bit money there. Also, we just want to make sure that um, folks who are dual eligible, if they have questions about their um, RLIS estimate, that they can reach out to me and I'm happy to provide those to them. And then we also have the link to the master eligibility spreadsheet as a lot of distributed this year. Um, so please be on the lookout for that and um, make sure that you know your district is aware if you had previously received Title V funds to go in and look um, because unfortunately due to the census data that we have to use for eligibility, folks are becoming, um, or I should say more and more districts are um, falling out of eligibility, unfortunately. Great. Um, you have Title III consortia questions in the chat, Daniel, if you want to address those and we'll kind of keep going. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to address those. Unfortunately, I can't see them. Would you be able to read those, please? Um, one is about whether those documents will advise LEAs on how to contact people to join a consortium. Okay, so as far as um, contacting other LEAs, 
Um, I think the best bet would be to reach out to their ESEA coordinator. Uh, if you have questions on who that might be, you know, feel free to reach out and I can um, happily provide email addresses to folks. And can a regional service center serve as fiscal agents for Title III consortia? Uh, no, it cannot. Thank you. All right, and I know real quickly, we, we've had this training, but I um, will continue to emphasize it because as folks know, those that work with their non-publics, we have updated the form. We've updated the complaint link that's on there. There's like a more updated formal complaint process that they'll see. And it'll say um, by accepting or by, you know, signing this document, you have, um, you have basically assured that you've seen the training because we finally sort of went over the large overview of equitable services for each of the titles and that reporting is online. And a lot of the supplemental documents are there where the green box, those are icons on our resources page. Um, and you can find the new forms there as well, um, but they will be in the grants for me application as they normally are. Um, and then I will work with my title one part D subpart two LEAs um, in the very near future, we'll have our own training about working with your neglected and delinquent residential facilities. Um, so just wanted to shout that that is all out there and you can certainly show your non-publics this page and let them know um, that this all exists for them to, to have. Monique, are you with oh, us? Good, good morning, everyone. Just wanna give you uh, not so much update. Uh, we still are working on calibrating all of the information so we don't we don't have any new identifications for under Maine's model school support for um, this year FY twenty four. We're hoping it's coming soon. Thank you. Um, we have our fiscal cor corner, but unfortunately Tyra can't make it today. I know everybody goes on these calls to have some time with Tyra here, um, so Travis will do his best um, to supplement. Travis. Yep, I'm I'm pinch hitting this morning for Tyra, so <laughs> bear with me here. So just a friendly reminder for folks that um, the State of Maine Department of Education does host a federal fiscal office hour uh, every month where uh, representatives from each of our different federal teams come together to support um, school district staff, in particularly uh, business office staff with uh, questions they may have around accounting or reporting or really anything else related to the fiscal administration of your ESEA, IDEA, CTE, et cetera grants. Um, so definitely be sure that you're sharing this with your uh, business office counterparts uh, if they uh, might be interested in this. And I am right now throwing um, a link in chat where you can uh, get access to sign up for the next office hour for that group, which is happening on um, I believe it's Thursday, April 25th at 10 a.m. in the morning. So a couple of reminders here over these next few slides. Um, we're intimately aware that this is budget season for um, seemingly everyone around the state. And so there are some uh, important considerations that we want to make sure uh, folks are aware of, cognizant of, et cetera, as they go about that budgeting process. So a couple of quick reminders here on uh, fiscal related definitions uh, pertaining to uh, the act of obligating funds and then um, when um, uh, an SAU may begin to obligate funds. So uh, by and large obligation occurs when your SAU enters into a binding written agreement of some kind to procure a good or a service uh, that could be a purchase order, contract, what have you, um, basically an agreement between your school organization and an outside entity to um, acquire, again, some sort of good or service. And then uh, as far as when that uh, obligation of funds can officially begin to happen, it really boils down to whatever the substantial approval date is for your uh, school district's ESE application for that fiscal year. Um, now, this could be as early as July 1st, uh, depending on how, A, early your application is submitted, and B, whether or not your organization requests 
pre-award costs as part of your ESEA funding application. So um, the key takeaways here are just ensure that uh, as you work to set up budgets and begin the, the process of obligating funds, uh, that you do so only uh, after you have that official substantial approval date. Okay, and so this is just a little bit of additional information to reiterate the point I just made. Um, you'll notice that as you access different portions of your application in Grants for Me, you'll see maybe a couple of uh, different data points here. Your, uh, your grant award notification is going to note essentially two different start dates. Um, the first of which here on the left is the first date that the federal funds are available. Uh, for obligation, uh, which is always going to be July 1st. Um, and then the date here on the right um, could be, again, as early as July 1st, but oftentimes is a bit after that. Um, you can see here, this one I believe is uh, in August. But essentially, the the one of these two dates you want to be more um, aware of is the one on the right, because again, that's your substantial approval date. And that's the first date that you can begin to obligate ESEA funds from that fiscal year for um, approvable grant expenses. So as far as budgeting and contracts are concerned, again, we know that folks are in the process right now of getting set up for the upcoming school year. So as you're thinking about the 24-25 or FY25 ESE application, um, you want to be intimately aware of that, um, you know, substantial approval date, particularly if you're in a situation where, you know, you may not have a whole lot of carryover and you may be relying heavily on new year funds to uh, support your ongoing ESEA work. It'll be really important that that application comes in uh, either on time or even early, um, or that you include a pre-award cost request as part of that application, because uh, that'll help essentially backdate or get you the earliest substantial approval date that you can um, and allow you to, again, begin obligating New Year funds earlier than you might otherwise uh, have been able to. Now, let's say, for example, you're in the process of planning right now and you're thinking about entering into a contract with an organization right now for services to start July 1. Uh, the only way you'd be able to do that through ESEA funding is if you were to leverage carryover funds from, at this point, either uh, FY22 or FY23. Um, it wouldn't be appropriate to try and start setting up anything prior to July 1st. Uh, with FY25 funds, because again, July 1st is the first day those funds become available. So anything prior to that would not be able to be paid with those funds. And this is something we really just want to reiterate for folks, because we have seen a somewhat of an uptick in instances of us having to reject uh, payment requests that are being submitted, uh, because the... Um, services or contracts, what have you related to those services are actually dated before uh, that substantial approval date. So again, just make sure that as you guys are going about the budgeting process and setting up contracts for the coming school year, uh, that you're, you're maintaining, um, you know, kind of appropriate timelines as far as uh, substantial approval and obligation dates are concerned. And more or less in the same train of thought, um, the, so the big thing again with contracts, I just mentioned that we've had to kind of reject some of these here over the not so distant uh, past here, but essentially you want to ensure that the service dates of the agreement, the date the contract is signed, um, all that sort of stuff occurs after your substantial approval date. You can do everything as far as negotiating and predetermining what's going to be in that contract ahead of that substantial approval date, but the official start date of the contract, the official date the contract is signed, all of that needs to occur after your substantial approval date, 
in the event you want to use new year funds to support whatever that expense is. Um, if you're in a situation where you do have access to carryover funds, that would be an example where you could enter into this agreement, um, you know, earlier than July 1st, and uh, you would at that point still be in, in good shape. But uh, again, if you're looking to implement um, or leverage new year funding to implement a new contract, uh, please be sure that, you know, the, the service dates and agreement approval date, all that occurs after your substantial approval date. Travis, I just wanted to add that um, this is becoming an issue with school improvement funds, especially for FY24, because FY24, we did have a substantial, substantial approval date. So some things are getting kicked back because contracts are before the substantial approval date. So um, if you're seeing that, that's probably why, because in FY24, we did have a substantial approval date. Thank you for that, Monique. Okay. And then just kind of one final reminder here. I know this is something that we've touched on, I think, in the last couple of office hours, but um, there have been some recent questions from folks around reimbursements for things like travel, professional development, tuition reimbursement, et cetera. Um, and more or less, the, the requirement here is that, um, you know, we, we can reimburse folks for that work. Um, but only after the the actual work has occurred. So um, it's particularly in the case of someone traveling uh, to a conference or, um, you know, maybe federal funds are being leveraged to cover the tuition costs for a uh, college or graduate course that somebody's taking. Uh, the reimbursement from the state to the SAU for those services uh, could only occur after uh, that travel or coursework has been successfully completed. Um, and the reason we do that is so that, um, A, we're abiding by uh, the uniform guidance here, um, but also so that we're never in a situation where uh, an SAU might have cash on hand or what's known as cash on hand um, being, uh, you know, if we were to reimburse somebody for travel that didn't end up happening or uh, for tuition for a course that uh, an employee never ended up completing. Uh, those would be examples of um, basically us paying for or reimbursing for work that was never completed. So um, just something to be cognizant of. I know it sometimes creates a little bit of a headache for for local business offices, but um, that is the the process and the the statutory requirements that we have to abide by. Um, and actually, before. Sorry, Rita, before we move on, I do see yeah. a question in chat from Dawn. Okay. So Dawn asks, how does this all dovetail with pre-approval requests in the app? So Dawn, can you maybe expand on that a little bit, what you mean by pre-approval requests? I can try. I don't okay. know if this will make sense, but I'll try. I know that there is a spot in the application where we ask for pre-approval, correct? So we might be able to pay um you know salaries over the summer yeah. or whatever so that's collection. yep so don that's that's pre-award costs okay, or that's sorry. that's the section i referred to yep so so essentially um and i think it's uh, it's in that allocations page section of the application but essentially anyone and everyone has the opportunity when they go to submit their esea application because the application isn't due until August 1st and funds are available federally as of July 1st. Um, if let's say you submit that application August 1st, but you need to be able to pay um, for some professional development that happens during the month of July, or you have uh, summer salaries for say your Title I staff that you want to pay for out of New Year funds, um, you can include those items as pre-award costs um, or a pre-award cost request in your application. Uh, and if approved, it would essentially backdate your substantial approval for those uh, expenses back to July 1st. So- and Only um, those specific expenses that you listed, correct? Like- Correct. So- be very yep. specific so the, about it. Yep. So the pre-award cost provision in statute is basically meant as a stopgap measure to get SAUs from 
July 1st to whatever their substantial approval date was. Um, so again, if you submit on time, i.e. August 1st, uh, those pre-award costs would really only be meant to, to help you get covered for that month of July that the application was kind of in limbo for. Um, <clears throat> does that make sense? Dawn? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. Yep. And yeah, Travis, it's always been a big deal to have the application on time, especially if you're looking at those pre and you want those pre-award costs. Yes. Please don't submit your application three months late and expect pre-award costs. Perfect. That Just wanted to reiterate. It won't happen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Um, yeah, we have um, a helpful little graphic here with open grants. Uh, again, uh, I know too on our resources page, we have the grant life cycle that I actually did just update with even closeouts because the FY23 performance report kind of caught people off guard when it came to closing out the 21 year. And from now on, every performance report is going to close out certain grants unless there's extensions or anything like that. So just wanted um, to alert folks that that's on our resources page and it shows kind of when invoicing is due, when it's, um, when you have to obligate by, when the performance report is due, that kind of thing. But this shows sort of when those funds need to be obligated by for each of those listed right there. Cool. And then as always, our professional learning opportunities are on the calendar. I think even Travis shared that previously. Um, and of course, there's us, and you know us, we're here. <laughs> you get emails from us all the time. Um, and so I'll just stop sharing. And if there are questions about earlier, I know folks were coming in as we spoke about spring monitoring, just uh, give folks a chance and I'll stop recording. Um,